Hey, hey, good morning. Hi, hey, hey, look what I got for you. Look, 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 look. Oh, 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 oh. Oh shit, pinch that onto my nipple. Oh. This, my friends, is an ice cold, refreshing glass of diet Catholic, otherwise known as Lutheranism. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting episode, <coughs> excuse me, of Atheist Church Audit. My name is Jared, I'm an atheist, and this morning, I already gave it away, I went to a Lutheran church. Always forget the names of these churches. There we go. This morning, I went to Hope Lutheran Church in Wakefield. Sorry, Wake Forest, not Wakefield. <coughs> now, everyone jokes that Lutherans are like diet Catholics, and uh, there, there's some similarities there. There's a lot of sit-stand, there's a lot of hymns, it's very traditional. To your son, Jesus Christ our Lord. But I'm going to cut to the point. This was a really positive service. This was a really awesome church. I will say that Lutherans tend to air a little gray. What's up, Silver Fox? This was a very old church, but it was a packed old church. And despite it being very elderly, I'm old. There was a lot of families there as well that kind of balanced everything out. The building was really beautiful. I mean, it was kind of a statement piece. Actually, the whole reason why I went to this church was because I passed it while visiting my new favorite coffee shop. Shout out to Wakefield. Wake Forest, not Wakefield. God. Anyway, I'll talk more about the building in a minute, but the service was really good. Do they see the love of Jesus Christ shining from us, glowing in us? So bright that maybe they need sunglasses or something like this. Now, again, with all denominations, uh, they have their progressive ah. splits and their conservative hey. splits. And so this was a conservative Lutheran church. Dr. Connors, are you Lutheran? They are a member of the Lutheran Missouri Senate, as opposed to the ELCLA or something. I don't know. Oh gosh, y'all suck with your naming conventions. Anyway, this is considered the more conservative Lutheran branch. The quiet conservative life. Now, they say conservative, but that's still a bit of a misnomer. You would be hard pressed to find a pulpit slamming, hellfire and brimstone Lutheran preacher in today's day and age. They're conservative in that they are biblical inerrantists. Uh, they don't allow female uh, pre priesthood leadership. They don't allow women to preach. <coughs> so they're more traditional in that sense, but even still in a more traditional church like this, it's very tame and it's very community oriented and it's very loving. Beloved, we are God's children now. The, the priest or father or pastor or president, I. I, I hate these naming conventions. They are so confusing. I've been to seminary and I don't even know what to call these people anymore. Pastor, we'll call him a pastor. The pastor did a really good job. His sermon was light and yet really passionate. And it was all about, you know, shining the light of Christ on the earth. And it was good. He read out of 1 John. The sermon had some good humor in it. It didn't seem like he was there to really shake the boat. Um, but I don't think that every sermon has to be that. No, no, he just seemed like a very crucial part of this community and was helping foster its spirituality. So there's nothing really to write home about as far as the church or the service. It just seemed like it was good. It seemed like it was doing a good job of what it was trying to do. So the thing that I actually really wanted to highlight about this church wasn't so much the church or the pastor or the sermon or the worship service itself, but it was a conversation that I had with a security guard. I got there right at 8.30 when the service started and it was packed. So I was literally sitting like, you know, back to the wall in the sanctuary, which is great. You just sit in the back and I don't wanna hear a peep out of your ass. And the guy to my left was, you know, the security guard. You know, he was probably like an usher, but he was also one of the Sunday school teachers. And he just, you know, kind of throughout the service, we were just, having a little back and forth. When they were taking communion, he saw that I didn't go up and uh, take communion with them. Well, why wouldn't you do that? And so he was like, hey man, just so you know, you know, in our denomination, you don't have to be a baptized Lutheran to take communion. As long as you're in right standing with God and you believe in the gospel, you can go and take communion as well. And I was like, oh word, I'll keep that in mind for next time. Now, as I'm talking to Tim, I kind of open up a little bit and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I do a lot of church hopping. I didn't quite come out and say, hey, I'm an atheist and I'm here to do a church audit. The conversation didn't really progress that far. But I did tell him like, oh yeah, you know, I church hop a lot. And to my surprise, he was like, that's so cool. That's awesome. You, you gotta go and see what's out there, man. That's really cool. And you're not allowed to do that. You can't do that. It's not something that you're allowed to say to encourage people to go and 
explore other denominations, let alone other faiths. So that struck me as cool in and of itself. But we got to talking more and he started opening up to me. Now, I want to be clear, this guy didn't strike me as like, you know, a closeted universalist who just so happened to, you know, be a member at a conservative Lutheran church. I think that he was really sincere in his Lutheranism. I think that he was a confident evangelical who really believed this, but, you know, who wasn't beat you over the head with it. And I remember being a kid and being really suspect of people like that but we'll get there. Anyway, we talk a little bit more and he just very like vulnerably opens up to me and he's like, yeah, you know, I was actually in the Air Force for a while and uh, I used to help out with the chaplain's office and, you know, I would set up for Christian services, Buddhist services, Islamic services, Wiccan services and, you know, the, the conversations that I had in there were, were wild, man. And then he told me about the chaplain and he was honest and the way that he described it, it was really funny and really sad at the same time. And he was like, oh man, he was, he was such a great guy. He, he really cared for the people in that community. Uh, you know, it's sad to say eventually he put a loaded bottle up to his head and uh, eventually drank himself to death. And, and it was just something that he said kind of like in passing, but he broke a couple of very important rules that you're not supposed to be allowed to break in a church setting. One, you're not allowed to say that your leaders failed. And I was sitting there kind of listening and I was like, you, you, you can't tell me that. You can't tell me that you had like a spiritual leader of yours commit suicide. That, 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 that's a truth that's too uncomfortable. You need to bury that shit. You need to shovel that down, suppress that, never talk about it again, don't, don't address it. And he didn't do that. He was just honest with himself and he was honest with me. Now, I had an evangelist friend who committed suicide when I was a kid. And, and that was a really hard and painful memory. And I sure as hell would have never shared that information with a visitor to my church. But it just kind of naturally came up in conversation and he was honest about it. And it made me respect him a lot. And it made me respect that community a lot. Now, please hear me out. I am not saying to go and just spew all of your j junk everywhere. That's not what I'm saying. My emotions! My emotions! This came about very naturally in the conversation. I think it came about in direct contrast to how many church cover-ups I've seen where their churches just refuse to admit their crap. They refuse to admit, hey, we had a pastor commit adultery. Hey, we had, you know, the church secretary was sleeping with some dude on the street. So. I think this guy's disposition was really healthy. And here's what I want to get at. Christians call the church their mother. And I worry that some Christians call their church mommy. Mommy. And this is dangerous. I think it's really bad. I went to this Catholic church a couple of weeks ago, the oldest church in America, the oldest congregation in America. And my biggest takeaway was I was really impressed with how they weren't micromanaging my spirituality. It wasn't like, hey, are you believing the right things? Are you thinking the right thoughts? Are you masturbating? Are you doing this and that? I didn't get that sense at all. It just felt like, hey, we're here to facilitate your spiritual journey. We are hoping and praying that it culminates in you confessing that Christ is Lord, but we're here for you until then. And that just felt like a very mature adult way to go about Christian spirituality. And I don't want my conservative Christian friends to mishear me. I'm not saying don't have doctrine. I'm not saying don't have a core belief statement because this church did. They had a pretty robust set of doctrines and dogmas. I think that's fine. But how you go about policing that on your congregants I think that's one of my big red flags for churches. I think it's fine and dandy if a pastor has said, hey, I've studied this issue, I'm very confident that this is what the Bible says about it, and I hope that I can persuade you into thinking the same way. That's fine. But there's a point where that becomes neurotic, where a church is saying, hey, I just, just checking in, just making sure that you're thinking the right thoughts, just making sure that you're believing the right things. Does your Facebook align with our doctrinal statement? And that's crazy to me. I'm an adult, I'm a grown ass man, and my hunch is that a lot of this stems from a lack of trust in God, a lack of trust in God's ability to gather his sheep unto himself. I think a lot of Christians have this 
very egocentric approach to it where it's like, well, I got to get that out there and I got to make sure that he thinks the right thing or else he's not going to get in heaven and that's going to be on my shoulders. And, and maybe it's not. Maybe calm down. The conversation with this guy was just awesome. And he opened up to me and he was like, yeah, man, I'm a PTSD survivor. And he said that in passing too. And it just felt like, man, you're really there just like before God trying to, you know, utilize his grace to help you work through your trauma and you're doing a good job of that. And, you know, if somebody wants to come along and, and walk with you through that journey, then more than welcome to. Like, that's just the sense that I got. That it's not a, like, you know, clenching you by your trench coat and saying, like, please come alongside with me and believe in Jesus. You know, he was just focused on the Lord and, and living right. And there was an open invitation to anyone who wanted to come alongside him. And it's a tempting offer. I'm not going to lie. Something that I always hear from the church members that I, I go and visit is always, come back and see us. You know, come back next Sunday. And he didn't say that. Instead, I think he said something along the lines of like, you're always welcome here. It's a small difference, but it just strikes me as so profoundly different. Like, hey, we don't need you to come here. We don't need your attendance. We don't need to check a box that, you know, this seat has been filled. But like, we're here if you need us. And that's a Christian W moment. That's, that's a big Christian W moment. As an aside, here's a little story I want to tell. Part of my backstory, uh, part of my lore, if you will, is that I was in a cult in the Netherlands for a little while. It was a small Pentecostal cult in Rotterdam and Holland. And, you know, it's a, it's a core piece of my history. It's a longer story for a longer video. But while I was there, one of the things that we had to do was we had to do street evangelism every other week. Occasionally, that meant me street preaching. Occasionally, it meant uh, carrying a life-size wooden cross uh, down, you know, cobblestone alleyways, waiting for somebody to come and be like, hey, what are you doing? Who's this Jesus guy? But I vividly remember this one encounter that I had with these two girls who were backpacking Europe. And I ended up buying coffee for them and, like, you know, was really interested in hearing their stories, but also, you know, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. So we're sipping on lattes and we're talking and and then I start sharing the testimony with them. And I could just kind of like see their eyes glaze over. And it was just clear that they weren't super interested. And I think had I been 16 rather than 19 at the time, I would have been like, well, let me just tell you one more thing. Let me just, let me just make one more point. Let me just get in there and say this one last thing that might convince you that Jesus is the Christ and that he's the risen Lord and he's coming back again. And... I was 19 at the time, and I was a little bit wiser and a little bit more mature, and I could tell that this was, you know, falling on deaf ears, and I was like, okay, well, tell me, tell me more about you guys, you know, what's, what's been the coolest part about backpacking? And so we leave the cafe and go outside, and we meet one of my co-patriots, compatriots, com co-patriots? compadres, one of my buddies in the church. And he wasn't privy to the conversation that we had just had, but he saw that I was with a couple of people and immediately he like ran up to him and was like, well, hey girls, you know, I, I know that you just had a conversation, but can I tell you about how God changed my life? And just immediately started running into the whole gospel message, a lot of which I had already given to them. And I did the unthinkable in that moment. I looked at them and I saw the same glassy gaze and I looked at him and I was like, hey man, they, they gotta go. Now I was a devoted believer at this point. I was a born again, you know, tongue speaking, prophesying, faith healing son of God. But I, I could tell in that moment, I don't need to baby their journey. I don't need to micromanage it. I don't need to get in there and, and just plaster on another coat of reassurance that they've gotten this message down pat. It, it felt redundant, it felt unnecessary. But I think just acknowledging like, hey, what's needed to be said has been said, and I'm going to trust in the Holy Spirit's ability to minister to them in his own time. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to be the best neighbor that I can be to these people. I'm going to be the best you know, friend that I can be to these people. Um, that's impactful, that's really impactful. Because nobody needs a spiritual nanny. That's annoying. Don't be annoying. Be like Tim. 
Tim was cool as fuck. And as the service was closing, you know, he, he just took such an interest in like me and my life. And, and it wasn't for the purpose of getting me to come back to church. It was just, he saw me as a human being, man. You know, he was really eager to introduce me to the pastor and, you know, shook my hand and smiled and, and that was that. And it was a really positive experience, like one of the best experiences I've had in the church. So Hope Lutheran Church, um, I'm gonna give you guys four out of five. Uh, four out of five, four out of five. Oh gosh. Uh, four out of five Lamborghini Huracans. Now my conversation with Tim, that was a five out of five, you know, home run banger. But you gotta acknowledge that like, I think that's an individual, right? That's a singular person in the church. That's not the totality of the congregation. I didn't really see any red flags with this church. I, I thought it was great. Very warm, very wholesome, and it was a cool example of some cool people who are still believers out there. That's about all I got for this one, friendos. My name is Jared. I'm an atheist. Um, I don't know. Go to church if you want to. I, I, I don't care. If you want to, it's fine. I'm not going to micromanage your, your spirituality, but if, if you're around one and you're bored on a Sunday morning, it's... It's fine, I guess. All right, get out of here. I got more Diet Catholicism to drink.